This is three-time world champion tree climber, Mark Chisholm. Was this something that you wanted to get into, or was this something that just kind of happened? Well, you know, it's it's uh, it kind of just happened. Um, every aspect of, of what I do is wrapped in tree care, arboriculture in some fashion. It, it really started when I was a young kid. I grew up in the industry. My father and mother had started our company, Aspen Tree Expert Company, here in New Jersey. Uh, so it was always kind of just like all around. And, you know, I, I, I pretty much immediately was drawn into the tree climbing part, not just the physical part, the groundwork, the chainsaw work, all that. Uh, something about the working at height appealed to me. Maybe because my father did it, maybe just because of part of the nature that I have or, or some of my tendencies as a child. I'm kind of always game to try things, you know, like if we're going to do like uh, bicycle riding, we're going to try to hit jumps. If you take me skiing, I'm going to try to hit jumps. You know, it's kind of like uh, I like the excitement aspect, I think, as well. But um, uh, all that stuff appealed to me. And then, you know, there was a period in time not long after that where I graduated from high school and uh, was trying to figure out whether I should stick with what I'm doing or move on down the road and try something else just because, you know, I didn't really know anything else. I, I started doing a little bit of soul searching. And, and the funny thing about it all was I got my two-year degree. And at that time, I had started getting involved in the tree climbing championships. But when I got involved in that, I saw the big picture of the industry around the world. I saw the camaraderie, and it just grabbed a hold of me at that point. And I realized, you know, I'm going to Rutgers to get a biology degree to maybe do this or that that I'm not 100% sure of. And um, and then it just hit me. I'm already doing what I really want to do, and I didn't really know it. I just I thought I was maybe taking the easy road or the easy way out and, you know, didn't want to take that without doing a little bit of really – kind of uh, soul searching to make sure I was taking the right path for me, not just for anybody else. So when you do the competition, are you competing in how fast you climb, how far, like what, what is the competition centered around? The one thing I'll tell everybody, cause they always assume I'm doing timber sports, which is logging base, you know, chainsaw cutting and chopping and all that. And it's not, if I look at the two, they're, they're a lot different in the idea that yes, they, they share some similarities, but in the tree climbing championships, we don't use any axes. We don't use any chainsaws. It's all climbing and it's, it's, it's as close as you can get to rock climbing in trees if you can visualize rock climbing and you'll get a picture but there's there's six events and it's both two of them are are just speed um the difference between the two is one is you just climb the rope and nothing else and it's uh 15 meters so about 50 feet and the other event is called the blade speed climb somebody at the ground is belaying you just like in a rock climbing uh, situation and that event will go from different different heights based on the trees in the geographical zone that we're in for example when we were in um out in seattle washington that climb was in a sequoia and it, we had a climb of like 94 feet or something which was a really fun one uh but that's all speed first one at the top of the tree hits the bell and you win that event if you're the fastest without any infractions and uh so that's one that actually appeals to me as well because i like the agility aspects now are you are you climbing like the main part of the tree like are you climbing up the branches or is it just however you get up yeah. is however you get up you can utilize the rope that's going to your anchor point in the top of the tree and you can utilize that rope if there's nothing to grab onto or you use the tree however you see fit so limb work and all that is what we do we don't climb with spikes because they're not good for trees unless you're doing a removal so this is not to kind of uh, kind of um emulate what you would do in a removal it's more about tree climbing and pruning and pr preservation of trees do you have i mean are there special gloves special shoes anything like that mm, yes and no um we do have gloves and boots that we use in tree climbing that it's not really unique to tree climbing per se they make them for other industries but they do work well for us it's not like gloves like for example I, i'm i'm a big fan of those rubber coated palm gloves because they give you a really good grip on rope and then everything else you touch the, the shoes the shoes that i always chose were in a class or a category they call approach shoes a mix between a boot and a rock climbing uh, shoe because they're not for wall climbing but they're for getting to the wall which have a kind of a stickier sole and 
um, you know, they're more like a boot looking, but they're flexible and sticky. All right. So uh, this is what I'm kind of imagining necessarily. Like, you know, you and the guys, you and the coworkers, like, how do you go from, hey, you know, he's pretty good at this to like, wow, you're, you should compete in this, right? How do you go from being kind of the good guy in the neighborhood to being a world champion? Like, how do you know that you're at that level? You know, I don't know that you do know. Uh, for me, I didn't know. Um, you know, back when I started the competition, um, I, I had just turned 18, was going to be 19. And by the time I did my first one, um, and the guys I worked with who were just starting to do it, um, like mentors of mine said, you should try it. You'd like it because you're a com- competitor. I like when I was young, I did soccer for five years. I did wrestling for three years and I always enjoyed the competition aspect. Um, but then I started working at such a, a young age. I never played football. I never continued with wrestling in high school or any of that. So it kind of brought me back to that thing. I, I felt like I missed out on because I chose to do tree work and worked on Saturdays. I missed out on kind of the sports and the comp- competitions and such. So this kind of appealed to me on that level. But to answer your question, I had no idea if I was good enough to compete against anyone. And it really didn't matter to me, to be honest with you. It was more about participating. And the guys around me said, just come, show up. You'll have a great time. You'll learn stuff. You're going to go home feeling gr- glad you did it, even if you come in last. And that, I, that felt like a no-lose scenario. Um, and my first competition in New Jersey at the New Jersey championship, I placed fifth overall over, I want to say there was like 25 competitors then, which was a pretty good showing. Um, but I really made some, some big mistakes for me personally, where I, I felt like I was sloppy and I was a little embarrassed by my showing and everybody supported me and said, no, you did great. What are you talking about? But I knew what I did wrong. And it kind of fueled me to want to come back and show myself that I could clean that up and do better and learn these other parts of the competition. I didn't really notice scoring, for example. Um, So it was a process, but I didn't know if I'd be good at it. And it wasn't until the the, the second year in New Jersey where I took second to the guy who was the champion the year prior and that year. And I got close to him and I started watching and learning and people would share things that I really said, you know, I think I could probably do pretty good at this, but it wasn't with any like monster goals or dreams. I just wanted to come back and do better than the year prior. What? Well, why are you good at it though? Is it is it a physical thing? Like, do you identify a path well? Like, what about you makes you good at it? You know, there's a there's a lot of ways to answer that because there's a lot of different components that I think you need to understand to get good at any event, including this one. So. I think obviously physical ability has a lot to do with it because you're doing a physical thing. You need to have agility. You need to have upper body strength. You need to have balance and all these different things you would need for any real athletic event. But I think you've got to learn how to um, also be kind of mentally able or mentally strong in the competition arena because it's just you against yourself and everybody else. You know, it's not a team event. Um, you have to go in there and know that whatever happens is your fault. It, whether you do good or bad is up to you. And if you're not happy with that, then you need to prepare better. Preparing means physically. Preparing means mentally. Um, preparing can mean um, learning the event, learning how you can get better scores, watching what other people did around you that were better than you in each event so you can draw from that. And then maybe uh, for me personally, what helped me excel is I think I was very passionate about it and I lived it all year round, you know, for 20 some years, I competed at the world championships and all year round, I would think about it. I would tweak my gear. I would keep an eye out for new gear and I would even create new techniques that I wanted to showcase at the event if I got the opportunity. And I think that wholehearted, all inclusive submersion in the event while I'm at work, while I'm at home, on Sundays, practicing and thinking about it is what drove me to become better. And that and, you know, the people around me brought me up in that each year I would compete, I would watch and learn and gather from everyone around me. And if they got better, I somehow got better. And it made me say, I can't be this level next year. Or I'm going to be left in the dust. So I need to get better even from here on out. And every year it was a push to get better. Are you all, is everybody on the same tree or do you climb different trees? Because I feel like one tree might be easier than the other tree necessarily, right? 
Yeah, no, we all follow the same track. Every event is identical for everybody. I'll give you the, the general kind of aspect of the event. There's five preliminary events. Everybody competes in those five preliminary events that add up a total point score. And you can win or lose every single one of those events in, by itself. But you gather points if you point a uh, place in anything across the whole board. And as you participate in all five, at the end of that, that day, um, the top five men and at the time the top three women would go on and compete in one more event the next day. Um, called the Masters Challenge, which is one event, and everybody does the same tree, but you have freedom to do it any way you want, meaning every every station, you can go in any order you want, use any gear you want, as long as it's safe and approved and best practice. What's kind of your basic strategy? Like when you approach the tree, what do you have, what's your strategy going into it? Um, you know, what I always try to do, and I was not always successful at this event where I probably could have been. Looking back now, I think I, I let things change my judgment based on what I was thinking at the time. But looking back, I see, I see it a little differently now. And I think what the real kind of blessing, if you will, is if you can see how to, how to solve that climb or solve that puzzle, so to speak, utilizing your best attributes, your best skills rather than doing it like someone else did in the past or would do because you think they're the best climber or they had the best climb last year and they beat you doing a certain way. Um, I think when I did the best is when I walked into that event and said, I'm just going to do my climb like I see the best way to climb this tree, not like not, not factoring in anything other than what I see for this tree. Do they rate the trees on a difficulty level, kind of like rock climbing is? I actually thought of that myself years ago. We talked about that idea of doing different ratings. Or, but what they actually do is we typically move around to a city anywhere in the world that, that it's kind of like a, it's kind of like the Olympics where they plan it like four years out, you know, where you're going to be every for the next four years. And, and it goes to a place that typically has some beautiful parks, natural areas where they can host this event. And they always have these grand trees. Some of the most beautiful, majestic trees I've ever climbed were in competitions you know i could think of trees in nashville to hawaii to over in the uk where uh, australia where these trees are just magnificent so the master's challenge is never going to be the easiest tree in the park it's always going to be the largest most technical tree that you can imagine and the guys and women that create the climbs are tend to be some of the best world champion ex-champion climbers that that help set these up so they make them very challenging and difficult so and the simplest answer is they'll put it at the, the highest level of difficulty that the tree and the parks will allow in, in the region we're in. So they're always a very difficult climb. Can you can people make a living off of this? Not really. Um, some people travel around and do competitions. So just competing alone will not really get you a very good income. I mean, it varies year to year. But you can go around and win thousands of dollars at each regional event and and prizes and cash so like i remember some world championships uh, in particular that i won where maybe i walked away with around five thousand dollars or plus in cash and prizes and um so that's not really a big payday but um what what is kind of really the payday for most of us is you get a free ride to some place in the world to be part of this event you get a free ride to the educational components and you get to see everybody and participate, and it doesn't cost you a dime. Um, everything's covered, travel inclusive. So that's the real payout for most people to that to get to that level and be part of the event and not have to come out of pocket on it. And if you win something, it's just, you know, great, thank you, and, and it's great to have that extra. But I think, um, like, for people like myself, what, what ends up paying more bills in the long run is when you become – of value to you know the industry because of your credentials and some of those may be based on the competition as well for example you know a brand ambassador uh, to some some organization or company that says we think you're a good fit for us and they'll pay you to do whatever advertising marketing or education are you ready for some of the listener slash harder questions absolutely best type of tree to climb wow so for me the best type of tree for me would be something that's in my wheelhouse where I felt like I excelled. And that would be a very large open tree. So you can imagine a very tall, 
very broad, majestic oak tree, for example, where there's a lot of room to limb walk and swing and jump because I'm a tall guy and athletic in that, in the tree climbing event as at any rate, maybe I'm not as athletic on the ground, you know, per se, but I'm pretty graceful in a tree where I can make a big jump swing movement, land it with grace. And I think that would, that makes me feel more confident approaching those climbs. So something really big, really spread out with a lot of swings and dynamic movements appeals to me, um, where maybe other people are intimidated by that climb and they prefer something, you know, more dense and uh, with a lot of limb structure. Wait a minute, you're like jumping from limb to limb? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's actually, you know, you asked me, what makes a good master climb something that, that, you know, to me is a good master's climb. One of the things I loved is when I walked up and saw the tree for the first time and scoped out the, the, the routes that they, they set up, if I could see a really dynamic jump or swing that I knew because of my athletic ability and my, my height and reach that I could create something that maybe other people would struggle with, which would be unique to me. And it would make other people who, you know, at the end of the day, if you're watching a world championship event, what you want to be is if you're an arborist, a tree climber from wherever you are in the world and you've never done this, you want to see something that impresses you. Just like when you watch professionals do anything, right? And I try to approach the climbs like that. Like I wanted to, to do something that shows the, the highest level of climbing that I could provide. And that's what I look for. So I love the jumps. I love the big swings. And I kind of developed a name for it uh, in, in that regard. I mean, obviously, there's safety precautions, but people can get hurt doing this, right? Have you ever gotten hurt? Yeah, unfortunately, you can get hurt. Luckily for me, I've not had more than bumps and bruises with the exception of maybe one smashed knee uh, in Baltimore because you know, it was raining earlier in the day. The trees were slippery, and I still went for these dynamic moves, and I just kind of didn't land it as solidly as I normally would smack my knee and had to finish the competition with a sore, stiff knee. It didn't really inhibit anything, but it definitely took my mind space a little bit. But there were a few people that have gotten hurt um, made a mistake that wasn't something you could see happening. You know, it wasn't something that was, you know, the judge's fault or anything else. The climber made an error and had to get rescued themselves from the event and brought to the hospital, but nothing, um, too drastic on the world championship event. At some of the regionals I've heard of, uh, some, some more difficult injuries that have happened, which is obviously something we, we try to avoid. Worst type of tree to climb. The worst type of tree to climb. For me, it, it depends. If you're talking competition, I don't want anything that's real like brittle um, where they don't allow you to tie in high and use that high tie-in point to pivot from. If the tree's real brittle as far as the type of wood it is, they'll, they'll limit how high in the tree we're allowed to tie in, which is the smart thing to do, but it limits what I can do as a climber to showcase my skills. So, I hated those. I also hate trees that have thorns and such that slow your movement down. Um, but in the workplace, by by far, the thing I hate the most is is like a tree covered in vines that is really overgrown because it just restricts all everything you need to do. Nothing but problems. <laughs> is there like I I don't know very much about trees, but to 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 people who compete in this, will they like? Oh no, it's a birch tree or it's an elm or like? Yeah. Will they look at yeah, it and say like? There. We've been there. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, in Toronto, uh, one year they did this this beautiful spot um, where we climbed on an island outside of the city. We had to take a ferry over at sunrise. It was a great magical event. But the trees on the island were limited, and they had to hold it in this really large scale willow tree. And willows are very brittle, you know. So a lot of us were like, oh, "We're climbing willows," you know. It's kind of a disappointment, but you, you, we all enjoyed the event. Um, nonetheless, but if we isolate the trees, we didn't really love those trees. Is there a place like what's the what's the tree climbers mecca? Like, man, you got to oh. go to. Well, I think it differs for everybody, but I bet a lot of us will be consistent in that we want to climb the biggest trees in the world. So for me, going out to California and climbing redwoods was like my pinnacle. You know, that's that's kind of like the Everest of trees, so to speak. Can you look at a tree without planning out how to climb it? That's no, you can't. <laughs> it's not happening. I, honestly, you can't 
go somewhere on vacation and not catch yourself looking at trees and looking at how, wow, that would be fun to climb or that would be miserable to climb. And yeah, no, you can't do that. (laughs) Best way to slip, I'm a world champion tree climber into a conversation. Uh, You can't. (laughs) You know what it is? It's always awkward when people ask you what you do. I look at, at whoever's with me and they roll their eyes and they're like, all right, how do we explain this one? <laughs> you know, it ends up being a long conversation. It's just like when you said, tell me what the world championships of tree climbing are about. Well, it's easiest if I show you a YouTube video, you search it and you can see for yourself, but um, it's a long discussion. It's not a two, two second answer. So you can't slip it in, you know, but it does come up when people do ask or they ask, they, they dig a little bit and, you, you eventually you can't avoid it. <laughs> this one, kind of along those lines. Um, have you ever used it to help in the romantic arena slash are there tree climbing groupies? <laughs> That's a good question. So for me, there's no tree climbing groupies that matter to me. I'm a married man for actually just celebrating my anniversary for 25 years now. My wife and actually... I met her because of the world championships because I was in, I was in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And after the event was over that night is when I met her early that night. And it's a long story after that, but eventually that's, she ended up being my wife. So (laughs) yeah, it could happen, but she was not impressed by tree climbers or tree climbing. That that's not what, uh, (laughs) what worked for me, but I, I definitely think there's uh, there's some people that think that it works for them. I've heard them talk about it, but (laughs) I don't know about that. Is there, okay, let me ask you this one other kind of question. Sure. Is there like, okay, so I'll take myself for example. My oldest son is four. He's starting to really get into the, you know, he's climbing trees. I'm old enough where I can't possibly keep up with him. Is there any tip that you can give me that like I can, I can show him the old man still knows what's up? Like what's your best, (laughs) what's your best novice tree climbing tip? So so for, for, I would tell you a couple one is don't get too carried away because once you start getting up up know your limitations and don't get too crazy unless you're going to learn how to climb with a rope and a harness because us professionals we're not allowed to leave the ground without being tied in at all times now try to keep three points of contact when you're doing that you know meaning two feet and an arm or two arms and a feet because that way you have good stability and if you're reaching on smaller diameter branches say Things for the general sake of, of not knowing a species and such, say three inch diameter and, and, and until you hit larger than that, you want to stay close to the tree trunk where it meets. Don't reach really like four foot out and grab on. That's when you break those branches. So that's when it gets more risky. So staying close and try to maintain three points of contact and you don't have a lot to worry about until you, until you get over that height of We'll say, I don't know, let's say 15 feet, it becomes deadly if you slip. That's pretty much all the questions I got, man. Anything else you think that we missed, and what's coming up next for you? Well, you know, um, I mean, I could talk about tree climbing and, and the industry at large for forever. It's just such a great industry. and I, So I will say that, you know, what I find is that the industry is unlike anything else out there. There's a camaraderie. There's a brotherhood, a sisterhood that's, that reaches internationally. And what I mean is you can literally, you don't have to have real connections anywhere. All you have to do is reach out, say, I'm an arborist from so-and-so. I'd love to come see your operation or spend a day. And everybody welcomes you in for the most part and wants to see you can work anywhere in the world in this trade in a matter of, of a heartbeat uh, on a whim, so to speak. And it's that's what it's all about. I want to thank Mark so much for joining us. If you want to connect with him, we have linked to him on our social media accounts. We're profoundly pointless on Twitter and Instagram. And we have also included his information on the RSS feed that's on this podcast. If you want to know about anything related to trees or arbor culture, man, I mean, he knows a lot about trees. I don't know anything about trees. So it's actually really kind of fascinating to check out his website if you get a chance. 